Good morning, everyone. This is Lynn Chase from the New England Clean QIO. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for the webinar, Ensuring Every Transition is a Safe Transition, a Community Approach. Before we get started, I'm going to quickly review a few housekeeping items. This call will be recorded for training purposes. The recorded presentation will be available within a few business days after the webinar. I'll provide you details on accessing that recording at the end of this session. The phone lines will remain on mute for the duration of the presentation. We will allow time at the end for questions. Um, and with that, I do want to get started. My name is Lynn Chase. I am the Massachusetts Program Director and the Regional Lead for the Safe Transitions Work at the New England Clean QIO. I've been with the QIO for six years, and prior to that, um, was at CBS Health for 17 years in their organization and uh, development group. Um, I have had the pleasure of working on Safe Transitions for the last six years, and I'm very excited about the opportunity for a regional approach. So that's about me. What I'd like to know is about you. And Emily, I'm wondering if you can open up the poll for the group. Um, we'd like to hear from you what care settings and or stakeholders are represented on today's call. And as you'll see, the poll has opened up, and you have about 25 seconds to respond. And the poll has just closed. If you did not have time to indicate your care setting, you can also tap that in via the chat function. I'm going to give it just a second for the results to tabulate. And as you can see, we've got um, a fairly significant amount from hospitals, nursing homes, and we have a few of you who, uh, who haven't yet answered, so we'd love to know where you're representing, and you can use the chat feature again to share that. So now that we know which care setting you're from, we'd like to know what states are represented on the call. And again, we're going to open this up as a poll. You'll have about 25 seconds to respond. The options are Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, or other. And the poll is now closed. We'll give it just a minute to tabulate the responses. Again, if you have not yet responded, you do have an option to type that into chat. Really want to know um, who's on the call, who are you representing? Get a sense of who the participants are. Great, and I'm seeing a little bit more response, so I appreciate that. We want an engaged group. We've got pretty good uh, representation from Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, and uh, just a few of you who um, didn't get to respond and hold quite quick enough, um, but we've got a few of these baked into the presentation. Um, although we're sharing, we really want to hear from you, and we're going to do that in two ways. One is the poll that we just used, and the other is the chat function. Throughout this call, we're going to ask you to chat in your ideas, share what you're doing, share what's working. Um, the more you're engaged, the more we know about you, and the more we can help make sure that this actually meets your, your needs. So our goals for today um, are really to just provide an outline of the New England Clean QIO focus areas, um, identify opportunities to improve care and conditions of care, highlight successful local communities in New England, and explore how you can be involved um, and lead this effort in your organization, your community, your state, and really regionally across New England. 
that's our goal, but again, I want to hear from you. So I'm going to ask if you chat in what you were hoping to gain from today's session. And today, uh, we do have a chat moderator, Cheryl Leary. Cheryl is the care transitions lead for the Massachusetts team, and she's going to be moderating your, your, um, your chat and responding to you throughout the session. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our first speaker, um, Carol Dietz. Carol is our regional hospital lead for the New England Clin QIO, and she's also the Connecticut um, Equality Improvement Consultant. She's been with Qualidine for six years um, and leading their hospital efforts um, since she began, and uh, really provides direction and support for the Hospital Associated Infection Reduction Collaborative uh, for the region, and also is the hospital lead for improving transitions of care. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol. Carol? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Lynn, for that nice introduction, and welcome to all our six New England states. As Lynn mentioned, I will be outlining the New England Quinn Quality Innovative Network Quality Improvement Organization, that's quite a mouthful, so I'm going to be changing that to the Quinn QIO. So I'm going to be focusing on the New England Quinn QIO areas of work and introducing the care transitions teams from our six New England states. So you can now start putting a face to the name as, as we have been introducing ourselves throughout the region, and hopefully we'll have a better connection with you as, as the future moves forward. Next slide, please. So, for those of you who are new to your role in your facility or have not yet heard of the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization Program, which we refer to as the QIO, this program is the largest federally funded program dedicated to healthcare quality for all healthcare settings. We provide support to acute care hospitals, nursing homes, home health agencies, physician offices, critical care access hospitals, inpatient psych, inpatient rehab facilities, and ambulatory surgery centers. For the past 30 years, the QIOs have been state-based, but the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which we refer to as CMS, they've modified this current contract, which started back on August 1, 2014, and has created two types of quality improvement organizations. The first is the Beneficiary Family-Centered Care, QIO, which we refer to as the BFCC QIO, which is now responsible for all the Medicare case reviews. And the second type of uh, QIO is the Quality Innovative Network QIO, which provides quality improvement, education, and technical assistance to providers within a region. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the BFCC QIO, which is, again, the Beneficiary Family-Centered Care QIO, they are responsible for the Medicare case reviews, and there are two contractors in the United States to complete this work. For the New England region, the contractor is Levanta, and on, on this slide are the very important numbers and address for this contractor and how to get a hold of them. So this is a nice resource for you if you ever need to get a hold of Levanta. Next slide, please. So enough about the BFCC QIO and more about the um, quality Innovative Network, Quality Improvement Organization, organizations, as, um, which is the New England Clean QIO. As I mentioned earlier, in the past, there were 53 state and territory-based QIOs throughout the nation. But as of last year, the CMS contract was modified to have the Quinn QIOs focus their work within a region and being responsible for several states within that region. The overall focus of the Quinn QIO is to provide support to achieve the triple aim, which is to improve health care, improve the health for the people and community, and also to make care more affordable. Another modification that CMS made to this new contract is that it's now a five-year contract instead of the three-year um, length that it, that it used to be. Next slide, please. The New England Queen QIO includes all of the six states in New England, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. 
Health Center Advisors, which is which was the QAO for Rhode Island, was awarded the Quinn QAO contract for New England, with Qualidime, which was the QAO for Connecticut, serving as a subcontractor and partner, forming the New England Quinn QAO. Health Center Advisors leads the effort in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine, while Qualidime leads the work in Connecticut, Vermont, and New Hampshire. But we all are one Quinn QAO, which is the New England Quinn QAO. Next slide. The focus of the regional model is to develop standardized approaches for implementation of evidence-based evidence -based best practices to improve care and to, and to share these approaches with our providers in our six New England states so that each facility can customize these best practices to ensure they fit into their culture. The areas of focus that the New England Quinn QAO experts are working on include assisting nursing homes in improving clinical outcomes, assisting hospitals in reducing specific hospital-associated infections. We are also working with physician offices on improving chronic disease awareness and prevention for their patients, and assisting providers with value-based payment and quality reporting. Finally, the New England Quinn QAO care transitions teams are working with providers and stakeholders across the care continuum to improve care transitions to reduce hospital readmissions. Next slide. The safe care transitions work also involves engaging patients and their caregivers to be involved in their care plan, also to reduce health care disparities in all settings, and finally to address the needs of the most vulnerable patients that include those with multiple chronic conditions, behavioral health conditions, and socioeconomic factors. The goal of the New England Quinn QIO is to create the healthiest region in the United States. It's a great goal, and we can achieve it by working together. Next slide. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be introducing you to each of the care transition safe, uh, safe transitions teams. Uh, one of the things I really want, want to get out of this for you is so you can put a face to a name. So here we go. This is the regional safe transitions team, which just met uh, at a face-to-face -face meeting last week, um, with, and, but we meet bi-weekly via conference call to discuss issues that are being addressed at the community level within each state and how we as the QIO, as the Queen QIO, excuse me, can spread the best practices that have been implemented and vetted to the other communities within the New England region. So let's start off with the Connecticut team. I do want to let everyone know we're doing this alphabetically, so no one um, will think that the Connecticut team is the best. So starting on the left and moving right, you'll see Janine Hewitt, who is our administrative assistant of the Connecticut team, followed by Deb Quetty. And I am um, next to Deb. Followed by, next to me is Ann Elmo, who is our state team lead who is also then followed by um, Sheila Eckenrode and then Florence Johnson. Not pictured in our, um, is our medication safety expert, Margie Giuliani, Giuliano, and we are honored to have her part of our team. Our team has an expert skill set, which includes quality improvement implementation, education, coaching, staff development, medication management, and community organizing. Next team. So this is the main team, and it's led by Maureen Leary, who brings a wealth of experience in community organizing for health and a passion for improving transitions of care for Maine residents. Her partner in this work is Alex Zamello, a pharmacist with years of hospital experience who wants to support Maine providers and stakeholders to reduce adverse drug events and other related medication issues that occur during transitions between settings. Our next team is the Massachusetts team. From left to right, sitting is Melissa Pollock, Alezi Victor, standing is Cheryl Leahy, and Lori Nierbaum. This team is led by Cheryl Leahy and includes members with leadership experience in nursing, healthcare policy, patient safety, community-based provider organization, which includes the Area Agency on Aging, and Aging Service Access Point. 
They also have pharmacy experience across multiple settings, as well as administrative support and law offices. Our next team is the New Hampshire team. Again, from left to right, we start with Joyce Johnson, Pam Heckman, and Margaret Crowley. This team is led by Joyce, who coordinated the Transitions of Care Initiative in New Hampshire and Vermont during the previous QIO scope of work contract. Her team brings years of nursing and quality improvement experience, along with an established relationship with the nursing home and home health care providers. Our next team is the Rhode Island team. Um, starting again on left to right, you'll find Blake Mor Morfus. Next to him is Amelia Silva Odom. Standing is Kathy Calandra. Next to Kathy is Maureen Marcella, then Melissa Miranda, and finally Pam Quinn. This team is led by Kathy Calandra, and this um, team has years of nursing, quality improvement, and care transition experience. I just want to mention that Blake, who is the manager of analytics, has started to um, he provides analytic support to all the state teams and has started to provide state and community level reports for each participating community. Very exciting time for us. Finally, last but definitely not least, is our Vermont team. Starting from left to right, front is Regina Ann Cooper and Gail Harbour. With, um, sitting in the back is Gail Colgan and Liz Kluckner. The Vermont team is led, led by Liz, bringing nursing, case management, care coordination, medication safety, and quality improvement experience, and a strong desire to help providers and stakeholders improve transitions of care for Vermont residents. Next slide, please. It is our hope the description of each of the team, along with a picture, will help connect you with your state's care transitions team. And as I mentioned earlier, put the face with a name. I would now like to turn over the presentation to my colleague from Rhode Island, Kathy Calandra, who will talk about identifying opportunities to improve care transitions, as well as spotlighting success stories from our community work. Kathy, the floor is now yours. Good morning, and thank you, Carol. Now you all have heard about our overall regional focus areas for this scope of work, in other words, the big picture. It's time to really get to the heart of our work, the idea of a community approach to make every care transition a safe transition. The overarching evaluation of care transitions improvement work is based upon reducing hospital readmissions. We know hospitals and other providers are working within their own four walls to impact this. Today, we will explore how this work is done when a community of stakeholders comes together. Why does this matter? Well, this is what we know. Each time a patient moves from one setting to another, a solid care transition needs to occur. Across the country, nearly one in five Medicare patients discharged from a hospital are readmitted within 30 days at a cost of over $26 billion every year. It is well documented that problems can occur during this transition of care that can cause an unplanned return trip to the ER and potential readmission. There are multiple models in existence today, sorry, and in the planning stages to decrease these costs. Some of you are well aware and may be involved in ACOs, bundled payments, preferred partners, and then there is the ever popular hospital readmission reduction program that the federal government has put into place. Hospitals are penalized on 30-day readmission rates for specific conditions, heart failure, acute MI, pneumonia, and new this year, COPD and the 30-day readmissions after total hip and total knee replacement. To date, over 2,600 hospitals were assessed penalties in 2015 under the readmission reduction program. The amount of the penalty ranged from 0.01% to 3% of their Medicare dollars that they would have received. What's important to note is the readmission rates are based on three prior years of performance, July 2010 through June of 2013. This becomes important when we are looking ahead to what is coming down the pike for other providers who will be involved in penalties in the future. 
What you are doing now impacts the future. In fiscal year 2013, total penalties amounted to $280 million. But there was a significant increase for 2015, a total of $428 million. This represents 75% of hospitals who received penalties. Hospitals have seen their own readmission reduction program data, but we are sharing a slide now of what these penalties look like in our region, the six New England states. As you can see, this program is having significant impact. In Massachusetts alone, 55 hospitals were impacted, which represents 80% of all of their hospitals. The average penalty was 0.78%. Vermont fared better, four hospitals were impacted with an average of 0.1% in penalties. When given a choice between a carrot or a stick, we would all choose carrots, I believe. But unfortunately, this idea of payment reform is not going away. The goal is to pay providers for doing the best care and the most cost-effective care. In 2018, nursing homes will be added to this value-based payment program. This will be rolled out in October of 2018, but as mentioned, it will be based on previous performance. This first adjustment and reimbursement will be based on 2016 performance. So the things that you put into place today to improve will matter. How this will work is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid plans to withhold 2% of nursing home payments in an incentive pool. The highest ranking home, based on their 2016 performance, will receive the highest return from this pool of money, a carrot. The lowest ranking will receive the lowest return, a big stick. The data on this slide of our region indicates that the southern states have greater opportunity for improvement. But, a, but experience tells us that you highest performers can have the greatest improvement. What we see here is room for improvement, but also an opportunity to share. This sharing of both successes and gaps allows us to really impact the population in our region in terms of the triple aim, better care, better health, lower cost. If we take a quick walk into the past, we may ask, how did we get here? Well, knowing what we know, the better question is, how can we improve? In the 1950s, there were not the same options available today. Payment models were extremely different, and most people who went to the hospital stayed there until they were able to go home. Their physicians followed them during their hospital stay, and were not in a position like today when they may or may not know their patient was even in the hospital and what that follow-up plan is supposed to look like. The first, sorry, next slide. How things have changed. Our population is aging and it is not uncommon for people to have multiple comorbid conditions and be prescribed multiple medications. They live longer, there are more options for services and treatment, and we can't ignore the socioeconomic factors that impact their health. Not only that, the healthcare system has become way complex. There are more options for post-hospital care, there are community supports, palliative care, Although the goal is for patient-centered care, the environment is right for problems to occur when processes and communications fail as the patient's care is transferred between settings, as medications are changed, and patient or caregiver input is somehow lost along the way. So how do we fix this? We are here today to tell you it can be done. Across the landscape of providers and care settings, we have seen work being done within each type of healthcare setting within their own four walls. You all are enhancing your methods for communication on discharges. You are addressing patient and caregiver activation, that is getting them involved in their decisions and their care. And many of you are creating standard clinical processes to decrease the risk of error. The challenge is the lack of control over what happens to the patient when they leave your setting and they move on to the next level of care. The care transition process, for example, when the patient leaves the nursing home to home, can put the patient at risk for an unplanned hospital readmission if a clear and concise follow-up plan has not been communicated adequately. 
problems occur when the patient becomes confused about his current medications versus the ones he was taking before he was admitted to the hospital and then the nursing home, or if he feels so great after his rehabilitation that he doesn't think he needs to keep his follow-up appointments with his primary care doctor or his cardiologist. There are several programs that address the care transition environment. They are evidence-based and there are documented best practices which have been shown to successfully reduce the admissions and result in better outcomes for patients. You see some of them listed here. We can also provide more detail on these resources. The best intervention, however, is one that is selected based on what a community of providers and support systems determine to be their area or areas of opportunity. A community working in partnership has a good chance of making inroads. Since they are dealing with a population of patients, they all are touching at one point or another across the continuum. The first step has to be an evaluation of the available data, though. Both the provider's own data and what the QIO can provide. You will hear from Lynn in just a few minutes about our report. Next, it is important to have honest discussions about the drivers of poor transition. Is there a breakdown in the information transfer between settings? Are papers lost? or incomplete? Is the electronic medical record access not shared between settings and needs to be explored? Is there one diagnosis that has a high readmission rate? Or are staff uncomfortable with having discussions about end-of-life care? So one size does not fit all clearly. These discussions among the community partners can evolve nicely into a root cause analysis of where the gaps are and what specific problems are occurring during the care transition process across settings. When the community partners determine what needs to be improved, what they need to do to get there, and how they will know that improvement occurred, only then can they select the most appropriate intervention. So I'd like to invite you to share in the chat box what programs, interventions, and efforts you have implemented or are considering either in your own facility or in partnership with other providers in your community. We would love to also hear if you are measuring results. So feel free to chat in our chat box that's being monitored. At this time, I would like to present two quick examples of successful communities of stakeholders who came together and improved not only readmission rates, but also their working relationships and thus their ability to sustain an environment where the patient is in the center. It really can be done. In 2010, Solidime developed a partnership with the Connecticut Hospital Association. They planned a full-day conference, which was hospital-focused, and had great speakers well-known for their successes in the areas of care transition, such as Dr. Eric Coleman. During lunch, they invited four hospitals into a private meeting to discuss the opportunities for community work and brainstorm about what partners should be around the table. Word got out about this great discussion and four more hospitals joined their meeting. Following this initial first step, a needs assessment was used to solicit more feedback on who their partners were in the community, what their readmission rates looked like, and what they had in place for medication reconciliation and discharge processes. Over the next five years, this grew into 15 active communities in Connecticut, or what we also refer to as coalitions. They had a common focus and committed to working collaboratively to improve care transition. Today, each community convenes on a regular basis. They have their own agendas. They continue to use the root cause analysis process when evaluating readmissions from all settings. At the table are hospitals, home health agencies, physician office staff, as well as physicians from the community and emergency department, palliative care, the agency on aging, just to name a few. Each community is unique, but it's all about patient-centered care and making transitions safer. Connecticut saw statewide success in their overall 2010 to 2012 data in terms of readmissions and admissions. As you can see, they saw a 21.6% relative improvement rate in readmissions alone. Also in 2010, in Rhode Island, Washington County, it was recognized there were problems within their system, and a physician champion facilitated bringing together staff who could address the communication issues between the hospital ER and the nursing home. 
By creating a forum for honest communication and collaboration, they were able to identify who needed to be at the table to help tackle these identified gaps. One of the things they discovered through their meetings was that a lack of understanding existed about roles in each setting. They implemented a formal shadowing program, Walk a Day in My Shoes. Their approach and results garnered national recognition by CMS and others around the country. They also identified issues of communication during nurse-to-nurse handoffs, and medication reconciliation was identified as an area of opportunity. They were able to involve the University of Rhode Island Pharmacy Program to implement enhanced medication management. They met regularly, agreed to share data, and used data available from the QuinQIO as well. They also agreed to collect data to demonstrate when improvement occurred. Today, they are working towards sharing electronic medical record portals with key partners and are sharing tools and resources across settings. Data from 2010 to 2012 clearly showed relative improvement in readmission rates and overall admission rates, as you can see on this graph. So, I want to put another plug in for CAT. Tell us what you've accomplished and how you did it. We know there are other success stories out there. In the interest of time, we just gave you two examples to try to paint the picture of how communities come together and are successful. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Lynn, who will address in more detail how you can help lead this effort in your organization, community, state, and across New England. Lynn? Great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I do want to just mention that we know that there are a lot of great activities and uh, success stories, and over the next four and a half years, we really hope to understand more about those successes and share and spread them across the region. So our QIO plan um, starts really with understanding and aligning related efforts. Um, it's a great time in healthcare. There are some amazing things going on, but um, it also can lead to provider uh, um, uh, being overwhelmed with requests for um, educational sessions and activities. And our goal really is to understand what those different requests are and try to align as much as possible um, to, to maximize the, be the benefit for the patients, but also to relieve the burden for the providers. Um, we want to provide participating providers with education and support on intervention selection, whether it's an um, evidence-based program um, like Interact or CTI or Boost, or um, uh, just the best practice improving um, information transfer. Um, and we also want to help, help support measurement, selection, and strategy, um, measures that are meaningful but also feasible. We want to work to connect providers um, across the continuum and build communities um, where you can partner, share, and best support your patients. And finally, we want to facilitate a regional learning and action network, and this is the first step. The goal is to bring you all together so that you can highlight what you're doing, what's working, and what's not, and learn from each other. So, with that, again, we'd like to um, open up a polling question and understand what other care transition efforts are you involved in. Um, and if I can have Emily open up the poll. Thanks, Emily. We're going to have about 25 seconds to respond. And the poll has closed, um, but uh, as you've seen throughout the webinar, you still have the opportunity to chat in. One of the challenges with this polling questions is it only allows you to select one, and I suspect um, many of you are involved in multiple efforts. Um, but we'll wait and see what the poll has to tell us. And we're seeing some internal efforts, some ACOs, bundle payments, um, and a, a lot of community partners, which is fantastic. Um, I do see uh, quite a few that didn't have a chance to answer, but we're hoping that you take the opportunity to respond in chat. We want to know what you're doing. 
Um, our goal really is to support community building. Um, and as I said, we want to build on your existing efforts. We don't want to start from scratch. We want to know what you're already doing and, and help expand that. Um, and that starts with really bringing the right partners to the table, helping to understand what that root of the problem actually is, um, where can we make the most difference, identifying interventions, and again, defining feasible and meaningful measurement strategies. Let's talk a little bit about that. The right composition um, for these community groups it certainly should include hospitals, community physician offices, pharmacies, um, both retail and academic, um, long-term care pharmacies, uh, nursing homes, community and social support, so um, adult day senior centers, uh, home health, um, stakeholders for aligned programs. Uh, patients and caregivers ideally are at the table um, and certainly represented. And most importantly, we want to make sure that you're at the table. And so again, I want, I want to hear from you. Who else are the critical players for your community solutions? Who do you need to have at the table? And again, Cheryl um, Leary, who is the Massachusetts lead for our care transitions work, is moderating chat, and she'll report back at the end. Um, in sort of the key themes that we've seen. I am going to open up um, another uh, poll and um, want to understand what readmission data is your organization reviewing. And so, um, thanks, Emily. We're going to give it about 25 seconds. We want to know if you're looking at your internal data, just all cause, if you're really focusing on a specific diagnosis. Um, if you're looking at intervention data, um, PEPPER reports, if you're still using the PEPPER report, or potentially ACO, uh, trade organization data, um, community partners, are you sharing data? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, any and all data that's available, none or other. And the poll has closed, but um, if you uh, didn't get a chance to respond in the poll, please use the opportunity to share in chat. Data really is going to drive our efforts, so understanding what you're looking at and what's important to you is really important to us. Give it just a second for the results to tabulate. And we see lots of all-cause readmission data, um, any and all data. That's my favorite, favorite answer. And again, we see a lot of people who didn't have an opportunity to respond in poll, but welcome your input in the chat. I want to talk a little bit about data because as the QIO, we're fortunate in that we're able to provide data. We have CMS claims data for Medicare fee-for-service patients, and we provide reports. And it's two types of reports, really. Um, we provide provider-level reports for all participating hospitals and nursing homes. Um, it, it really, throughout the region, if, you, if you're interested in this data, we can provide these reports. We would provide home health data, but quite frankly, HHQI, which is the Home Health Quality Initiative, um, is, uh, provides fantastic and more timely data than we, than we actually have access to. I, uh, whenever we provide these data reports, I try to highlight the, what it is and what it's not. So this is trending 30-day all-cause readmission rates. These are raw claims. They are not risk-adjusted, and that's important when you're comparing it with other data sources. Um, it's also Medicare fee-for-service only. Um, so if you have a high penetration of Medicare Advantage, they will not be reflected in our report. We do include both state and regional benchmarks. Um, we highlight the demographics and um, diagnosis information. Again, um, understanding data, what it is and what it's not, um, and what else you need. So it's Medicare fee-for-service population, but what's important about that is that it's the same population as the value-based payment program. Um, these are raw claims. They're not risk adjusted, so it doesn't match your publicly reported data. And there is a data lag. Um, there's a six to nine month data lag. So it's great for trending, not so great for QI. Uh, the best data really is yours. And that's what our teams will help you do is both identify what, where is the best opportunity to look at all of your readmission re data, but also your intervention data. Um, this is a phased approach. We are building communities over time, and I want to sort of walk you through where we are in the process in each of our states. 
So in Connecticut, we are going to be working in the Hartford, Middletown, and New Haven areas. Um, these are existing communities for the most part. We're going to be building on what, um, what the Connecticut team has been doing previously. If you have questions or not involved, want to learn more, I encourage you to contact the state lead in, in Connecticut. That's Ann Elwell, and we'll be providing her contact information. Um, and in Maine, we're working at really, we call it the northern Maine um, area, but it really uh, stems from uh, sort of the central Maine all the way up into the uh, Aroostook County. Um, we've got a lot of great engaged providers. If you haven't come to the table yet, we encourage you to, to contact Maureen Leary. Um, she would be very excited to have you involved in this work. And in Massachusetts, we're working in a few communities. We're working in um, the central Ma uh, Mass Metro West. Um, we're also looking at uh, West Merrimack and Middlesex. Um, eventually, we'll be moving into Metro Boston and um, have some work already started in the southeastern. I will say that um, all of these efforts were up and running, and we were just very excited to be able to come to the table and help support the work that's already going on. I take a quick look at New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, Joyce Johnson is working in Manchester and Nashua. Um, she's also got a Portsmouth community that is up and running. And in Rhode Island, I'm happy to say that it's actually a statewide effort. Um, we're working in um, throughout the communities. There are four. There's the Greater Providence, the Warwick, the Washington County, and the Newport community. If you're not already involved in that effort, please contact Kathy Calander. She'd be happy to get you engaged. And in Vermont, we're starting small. We're starting in Windsor community. Um, again, if you're interested in being involved in that effort, that's Liz Kleckner. I really encourage you, if you're ready to join or you just want to learn more, to connect with your state transition uh, lead. And um, they would be happy to get you involved. If we're not currently in your community, we'll be working towards that. Um, we're starting small and uh, adding communities um, each year. And with that, I do want to open it up um, for questions, discussions, comments, and recommendations. And was wondering, Mary, if you could uh, instruct the participants how they can open their phone lines. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. I will open your lines one at a time so that you can ask your questions. When your line is live, you'll hear a prompt asking you to proceed with your question. We're ready for questions now. Please press star 1. I don't have any questions. Oh, here we go. Here comes the question now. One moment. Caller, you're on the podium. You may proceed with your question. It seems like somebody may have uh, selected the option and uh, wasn't quite ready to speak. I'm wondering, Cheryl, if you could report out some of the, the discussions and um, questions that we're starting to see in chat. Sure. We have one question that came earlier um, from Karen Diamond. How is home care being integrated into transitional care? And Cheryl, um, as we live in uh, Massachusetts, do you want to talk a little bit about how you're incorporating? Absolutely. So home care is a key partner in the care transition partner process, and we certainly want our home care providers to be at the table and joining us in community coalitions. Um, we are working to reach out to the trade associations to find the home cares if they haven't come to us yet. We want to make sure that we have everyone together. We want the home care to be able to have that open line of communication with the hospital, with the SNFs, with all of the different partners who are coming to the table. And Kathy, in Rhode Island, I know you've had a lot of home care agencies at the table. Can you talk a little bit about how they're being incorporated? Absolutely. 
In Providence, we at one of our chairs of our coalition is at, actually represents one of our large DNAs. Um, she's uh, a clinical liaison. And then in all of our four coalitions, the DNAs that cover those communities are at the table. We also have the advantage of bringing them together for a just a home health agency collaborative. We do that quarterly, and that allows them to bring to the table um, their pain points and what is specific to their environment that's impacting care transition. So it's a little bit deeper focus in their world. And I guess I would be remiss if I just didn't mention that um, the New England ClinQIO is actively outreaching to home care agencies, Medicare certified home care agencies, um, to partner not only on care transitions, but also on the cardiac um, RAN that is being convened by um, home health quality initiatives. It's a great opportunity to engage in not only um, the cardiac work, but also care transitions. Um, so, again, if you're interested in learning more, we'd love to have you at the table. Just contact your state lead. Um, I do see another question about those slides that will be available, and they're actually already up on our website, and we'll provide you the website location in just a minute. Cheryl's typing it in as we speak. And Mary, I'm just going to check in and see. Do you have any other call questions on the line? I do. I do have a question waiting. Here we go. Hi. Do you have a question for us? Discussion? Perhaps they're on mute. I, you may be on mute. Go ahead, caller. Your question is live. Not sure if the line is on mute, um, but if you're having trouble getting it through on the audio, feel free to chat it in. We definitely want to hear from you. We want to know. Um, Really, what, what questions, comments, or recommendations that you have for the, the state teams? We want to know how we can best support you. Um, this is your opportunity to tell us that. We had some great um, interaction on chat, and a lot of the um, attendees were telling us that they are working very hard to improve communication, and they're really working within their community network. And I think um, the call to action would be to make sure that you're reaching out to your state lead when you have these community networks. We'd like to learn more. We'd like to help your community networks. Um, we'd like to, to provide you with some data and, and find out more about what you're doing. That's a great point, Cheryl. Um, that as, as we said, again, we have the, the data reports um, that are available. Uh, I, I did want to mention that the data that uh, Kathy shared, the statewide data, was Q3 of 2014. I'm excited to say that yesterday in our inbox, we just received the latest and greatest data, which is Q4. Uh, as I said, there's a little bit of a delay, but we're very excited to be able to pull those reports together. We have provider-level reports for hospitals, and that is every acute care hospital throughout the, um, New England. Um, if you haven't gotten a report and you, you want to get your report, please contact your state lead. We also have reports, readmission reports available for all of the nursing homes. Um, across the, the region. We run them for all of the nursing homes. So if you haven't gotten your report, contact your state lead or your nursing home um, collaborative lead, and they would be happy to get that to you. Uh, we run the community reports, and the community report is really less about you and more about um, the patients who live in your zip code catchment area, so the patients you're taking care of. Um, and that is a, a population-based measure, um, and it shows, I think, the results of working collaboratively with your partners across the continuum. And for our um, stakeholders and um, partners in this work, we also run statewide reports. So it's aggregate data, uh, and it gives a good sense of uh, how the states are looking. I did want to mention that the chart we showed about uh, comparing the states was a bar chart. Um, 
typically we show a trend chart to see not only what your performance is, but how your performance is um, trending over time. Is it improving or um, is there some opportunity to, to really focus in on that? I'm going to do a quick call and ask Mary if there are any other calls waiting for questions. Uh, I don't have any calls waiting at this time. Mary, can you just remind the group how to, um, to submit a question, please? Certainly. If you'd like to ask a question, just press star 1. When I uh, open your line, you'll hear a prompt in your ear letting you know that you're on the podium and you may proceed with your questions. So, again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question, please press star 1. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary. And um, I do see a, a question coming up on chat. We'll, we'll be receiving copies of the presentation. The presentation has actually been posted on the um, New England Quinn website. Um, and Cheryl, uh, just type that in. It's www.healthcareforneuengland.org, all one word. Um, all of our tools, resources are on that website. I'm going to do just one last check to see if there are any questions on the audio line. Mary? There are no questions at this time. Okay. Well, we're always open uh, for your questions, comments, suggestions, recommendations, um, and I hope that when you walk away from this webinar, you get a sense of where our focus areas are and really who you can reach out to um, to become involved. We talked a lot about care transitions, and one of the um, key areas that contributes to care transitions are adverse drug events, and it is a special focus of this work. Um, adverse drug events account for approximately one-third of hospital adverse events. Adverse drug events um, results in about 280,000 hospital admissions annually. Um, hospital admissions are related to ADEs in adults 65 or older, was 24.9%, and um, it's been estimated that about a quarter of those are actually preventable. Um, and life transitions, they're expensive. As CDC actually estimates that $3.5 billion spent on extra medical costs associated with ADEs. So this is a special focus of um, CMS, and it's certainly related to the care transitions work. And so with that, um, on our next webinar event, we are really going to be focused on improving transitions of care by enhancing medication safety. Um, that event, we'd like you to save the date, is Thursday, June 25th, and it will run from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, the details of the event will be shared, so distributed to our mailing list. If we don't have your email, please contact your state news and they'll add you. Um, in May, and it will also be posted on our website, again, www.healthcareforneuengland, all one word, um, dot org. And finally, um, I just wanted to, again, highlight your safe transition state lead in Connecticut. That Ann Elwell. Ann has been uh, leading this work for the last few folks. Um, and she has a fantastic team of um, who, who you've probably been working with, uh, Maureen Leary in Maine, uh, Cheryl in Massachusetts. Cheryl has um, been graciously moderating our chat and previously typing. Uh, Joyce Johnson uh, in New Hampshire, and Joyce has been leading the care transitions work for the last uh, three years. Uh, Kathy Calandra in Rhode Island. Kathy was um, so good to speak to us earlier. And Liz Kleffner in Vermont. We've included both their names as well as their email addresses on this slide. And again, those slides will be posted on our website, www.healthcareforneuengland.org. And so before I close this session, I just wanted to see if there are any other comments questions or key areas that you wanted to highlight from um, chat? From our chat, I have to say you have been a great audience. Thank you so much for your active participation. I will say it sounds as though our partners are out there and doing a tremendous amount of good work, working in community transition networks, community partnerships. A lot of ACOs, um, bundled payments were shown as coming up as things that um, these, these providers are working on. 
Um, it was a very impressive group as a whole, and I can't say enough that we welcome your participation and contact your state needs. We want to hear from you. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, the, the kind of key areas I'd like to highlight are um, that we are very excited to have the opportunity not only to work within a state, but across the region. Um, I think it gives us a unique opportunity to connect providers beyond the state borders, those who are um, doing some amazing things and getting great results, as well as those who may be struggling and just need to connect with somebody else who's been able to, to figure out a way around it. Um, we're, we're excited about that opportunity. We're also really excited to have an opportunity to work with you, to help you look at your um, readmissions and transitions of care, areas that are important to you, um, help you identify interventions that are appropriate, and measurement strategies that are both feasible and meaningful. And we're excited to be able to share that data and explore it. Um, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, we're here. We're excited to to work with you, and we're looking forward to uh, having you all on the next call, June 25th, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., focused on um, improving care transitions through medication safety. And with that, I thank you all so much for your time and attention on this Friday. We're looking forward to partnering with you. You all have a great day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.